If you're watching this video, chances are your church is deciding whether or not to leave the United Methodist denomination. And that's a very difficult decision. And it's difficult to find good information, good information about both the Global Methodist and the United Methodist denomination. My name is Jeff Pospisil. I'm a CPA here in Mitchell, South Dakota. I happen to have served the Dakota's UMC as conference treasurer for 14 years, and I'm currently on the advising team for the Global Methodist denomination here in the Dakotas and Minnesota. So I've been from church to church to church and making presentations on the differences between the two denominations. And because we're running so short on time, the window to disaffiliate is, is coming on us. And, and, and in fact, I encourage churches, if you're going to decide, make a decision on whether or not to leave, you probably need to do that before the end of February. So I'm going to just go through a presentation that will hopefully help you. It's just going to be comparing what I normally would compare and present at a church. So I start off by talking about this guy, this picture of Peter Cartwright. He was one of the, the main movers in, United, or in Methodism, I guess. He was a circuit rider. He was a military veteran. And he had planted, they estimate, about 75 churches and baptized maybe 10,000 people. And he was a tough customer. Uh, the bar owners, the saloon owners, they did not like him because when he came into town, revival happened and the, their business would dry up. So there is a story about one saloon owner that was kind of talking tough. And he said, well, if Peter Cartwright comes in here, he might ride in on a horse, but he's going to be leaving in a box. Well, this got back to Peter Cartwright. And Peter went and found the saloon owner and called him out and they got into a fight and Peter had him pinned to the ground and he's, as he's wailing on him, he's singing at the top of his lungs, all hail the power of Jesus name. You know, so he was, he was quite the character, but he was tough. And that's one thing that I think we need a little bit of at this time. If we're going to make a decision like this, we need that toughness, you know, whether or not you're going to stay United Methodist or go global Methodist, this is a tough decision and it takes a little bit of toughness for us. First thing we're going to look at is the cost. I'm an accountant and I'm a cheap accountant. Maybe that's uh, repeating myself, but I want to know the cost before I make a decision. And I'm going to say this, first of all, this should not be the primary reason why you choose to leave or stay with a denomination, but it is important. Kind of hard to do ministry without money. So let's go ahead and look at the difference. The first cost we need to be aware of is the disaffiliation cost. So this is the cost to leave the United Methodist denomination. And this is going to vary very widely from conference to conference. And actually within a conference, it'll change too based on the, the wisdom and the whims of the leadership. So here it is in the Dakotas. I think we have a very reasonable, fair cost. It starts off by a church needs to be current on their apportionment since 2020. So if you were withholding apportionments or you just couldn't pay them, you need to get current on your apportionments since 2020 up until the date of disaffiliation. And then instead of the full 12 months at the at the regular uh, regular price, it's actually down. Um, it's 20% of what the regular apportionment amount is. And in our case, in the Dakotas, it's 3% of your operating income. The next part is the pension withdrawal liability. And this is caring for those pastors that served your church. And in the Dakotas, we do base it on the years of service that a pastor served you. So those pastors or their spouse that is still living, we match up those years of service. And then we have a rate that is um, that, that covers that liability then. And then the last piece is for uh, buying the properties. So to satisfy the trust clause, it's $1. So again, I think that's a, a pretty fair way of coming up with the disaffiliation costs. But let's look at what it might look like for a typical Dakota's UMC church. Normally what I would do if I visited your church, I would run your numbers at least as close as I could get. So I'm just going to base this off of a, a medium-sized church with a budget of $130,000 that was primarily served by a full-time United Methodist pastor. So if they were keeping up on their apportionments, they would owe nothing for the past apportionments. 
but then they would have that um, additional 12 months at 3%. So $130,000 is what they normally bring in. So they would owe about $4,000. Typically it's about for the pension liability, about $15,000 per full-time pastor. So if you've been served by part-time pastors, that's going to be less. Or if you've been sharing a pastor with another church, that would be less. Or maybe sometimes you've had a pastor of another denomination. That's also going to reduce your pension liability. Or if you've had, Two United Methodist pastors normally, that's going to double that. So just keep that in mind. And then the last one is that dollar for the trust clause. So that's the easy one. I do have a spreadsheet out there, and I'll go ahead and link to that. It's probably in a different post. Uh, so I will link to that. If you are with another conference, and hopefully they are open with you about what the costs are, uh, I might encourage you if you're, they're not open. It, it probably doesn't hurt to have a lawyer write a letter saying we need these costs. Um, if you want us to, to I mean, it, yeah, I, that would not be a bad solution is to have a lawyer write a letter saying my client needs these estimates for their planning purposes. So just, just a suggestion. The disaffiliation cost, though, that is a one-time cost. That's a one-time event versus what about those ongoing costs because those can add up those can make a huge difference and when i look at it i'm going to pair the global methodist denomination which is standardized by the way so a church in arkansas or alabama or the dakotas this is going to be the same no matter where you're at versus the united methodist i'm going to use the dakotas as as my base i guess although every conference is different. Every conference will do apportionments differently, do health and pension differently. So uh, there you're, you're going to have to look at your own context. But for apportionments in the global Methodist denom denomination starting in 2023, the apportionment is 2% of operating income. So let's just say your operating income is $100,000. That means your apportionment is $2,000. And this is based on the prior year's income versus the global method our Dakota's UMC at that's 14% of your operating income and that's going to be pretty pretty close to where most uh, conferences are so again if you have that same hundred thousand dollars in operating income you're paying 14,000 versus 2,000 so that's a big difference there when you look at the pension and disability if you have a full-time global Methodist pastor the cost will be right around seven thousand dollars Versus in the UMC, at least the Dakota's UMC, it's going to be closer to $11,000. And then the big difference here is in the health benefits. In the Dakota's UMC, by the way, we're used to blending those rates. And you pay a set amount, no matter if your pastor has single coverage, two-party, or family. And actually, even if you opt out, you end up paying, uh, paying I don't know, you pay a, an amount also if you opt out. So it might be half the normal amount for example, versus the global Methodist denomination, you pay for what your pastor receives. So if your pastor is on single coverage, you pay single coverage amount. If your pastor is on family coverage, you pay family coverage. So that's a big difference. So your church may or may not see savings here. Uh, one of the key differences too, if your pastor, let's just say they have TRICARE, or maybe they have, um, they're on Medicare, or maybe they are um, on their spouse's coverage, your church doesn't pay anything in that case. If they have a valid reason for opting out, and there are certain reasons, then your church doesn't have to pay that um, opt-out amount like the in the United Methodist for the Dakotas. I'm going to go ahead and skip to 2025, though, because that'll be an important year for both denominations. The Global Methodists will have had their convening general conference, and the United Methodists will have had a... Um, general conference period. So that's that national meeting of the denominations. So for the global Methodists, they're working under transitional rules. So these are temporary rules. Just to try to put something down so that we have something to work with. And right now what's currently written is that the highest that the apportionment can be is six and a half percent. And that it actually takes a super majority of people at the national meeting to end up increasing that. I don't expect churches to be apportioned the full six and a half percent. I actually would think it'd be closer to four or five percent. 
That's and again, that's my opinion, um, but I don't think it'll be six and a half percent. The United Methodists they have a different challenge because as they are losing churches, they it's it's very difficult for the general agencies and the conferences to shave that much off their budget. I know I've been a conference treasurer and it is very difficult to adjust to that. So they will either have to build their churches more or greatly reduce their bureaucracy and everything that they have, their programming. So there's gonna be pressure. I know that the Dakotas UMC, we wanted to bring that down to a 10% apportionment, but there's, the, there's gonna be a lot of pressure to keep it at 14% because of the fewer churches or to even raise that higher than 14%. For the pensions and the health for the Global Methodists, it's gonna basically stay the same going forward. For the United Methodists though, the pension will finally, they'll finally approve a plan to, that they're gonna move more towards what the Global Methodists already have, a, a simpler pension plan. And that'll bring the cost down by roughly 20%. So down to maybe $9,000. The, the difference there is primarily in the disability coverage. The disability coverage for the United Methodists is more expensive than it is for the Global Methodists. For the typical church in the Dakotas UMC, if you were to decide to pay that disaffiliation cost and become Global Methodist, it would take you about two to three years to recover that because it is a lot cheaper to be Global Methodist than it is to be United Methodist. For other conferences, it might take longer, but it will be cheaper in the long run to be Global Methodist than United Methodist. And by the way, I'm just gonna say this again, the cost is not the primary reason you should pick a denomination, but it is still an important factor. So we've talked about the costs, and now we're gonna shift and we're gonna look more at the bureaucracy and the structure and the differences between the two different denominations. And I value simplicity. Uh, first of all, it's usually cheaper. Second of all, um, if things are too complex, it can just paralyze you, especially as a local church. You just have to take their word for granted. You really can't challenge it because it's difficult to understand. So let's go ahead and look at the difference. Let's do what I call a red tape analysis between the two different denominations. So what I call red tape is those rules and regulations and structures over top of a church that make it slower to get to where you want to go. So you know you want to go there, but you got to follow this process. You got to fill out these forms, all that kind of stuff. And a lot of times that's not bad. A lot of times they make you think through things before you pull the trigger on a decision. But sometimes they are just jumping through hoops. Sometimes it is discouraging and making ministry just more difficult without the added benefit. They may have been well-meaning, but they're not, they're not doing a good job. And so when we look at the books of discipline for the two different denominations, the United Methodist Book of Discipline, it's 900 pages long. And I think like the first 100 or so pages is the theology and history, but then the next 800 pages is rules. So that's a lot of rules. And you know, as the United Methodist, they get pretty detailed. They say, if you're a local church, you got to have these different committees with these number of people on them meeting this often and doing these different things. So they get very, very detailed on how every United Methodist Church should be structured and how they should do their business. Now you look at the Global Methodist, their book of discipline is only about 100 pages long and it will grow, by the way. Um, but about probably about half of it, again, is theology and history and the other half is rules. And you can see it again, when you look at the governance of a local church, what they're talking about is um, that every church needs to care for the finances, property, and people. And how you do it, that's more or less your own business. How many people you have on there, how often, but you know your own context, but care for the property, the people, and the finances. There are some rules in there. I'm, I'm sure you have to have an audit and that kind of thing, but a lot less rules, more up to the local church on how to get the business done. Next thing we wanna look at is the general agencies. And the reason why I wanna look at that is general agencies, those are those top, top government agencies like the IRS, the Department of Education, Department of Transportation, and they produce a lot of the red tape. 
Um, they're looking down at the local churches and they're trying to organize it. And one of the ways they try to organize the work of the local church is by producing red tape. And in the United Methodist denomination, there's 13 of them. So there's just, um, and, and by the way, I don't want to, I, I really appreciate the work of GCFA and I really have appreciated the work of Westpath. So, I mean, general agencies, they have a purpose and they can be a big benefit to the local church, but they also produce red tape. And when you look at the global Methodists, they currently don't have any general agencies, but in the book of discipline, they are, they are planning on having six of them to care for stuff like missions and that like, and that kind of thing. And then the last thing is what will stop the red tape from growing? Because red tape grows automatically unless you have some individual that really wants to, to focus in and, and cut it down. And even that is very difficult. And in the United Methodist denomination, there's nothing to limit the red tape. In the global Methodist denomination, um, I think they're hoping that if you limit the funding to those agencies that produce most of the red tape, you'll eliminate most of the red tape from being produced. So they are limiting the general church apportionment to 1.5%. So of that 6.5%, 1.5% would be the maximum that goes to the general church, and the, the remaining amount would go to the conferences to do their work. So you could see a very big difference in the amount of red tape and the simplicity as well. And I could talk, you know, even about becoming a pastor. It's much easier to become a pastor, simpler to become a pastor under the Global Methodist than it is under the United Methodist. And there's a bunch of other examples that I could bring up as well. I think this is going to continue, though, as well for the, the Global Methodist and United Methodist. And part of the reason is because the, the people that are attracted to each. This is a pupil of United Methodists. And those that identify as conservative, which are more likely to become global Methodists, favor a smaller government. They, they really don't trust government as much as those that are more liberal. They favor a larger government. And I like this. There's a quote by Dennis Prager. And he says, the, the larger the government, the smaller the citizen. And that resonates with me. And I think the same thing for the local church as well is the larger your church government, the smaller the church is. So the larger your denominational government, the smaller the church is. So that's why I think it'll continue going forward that the global Methodists will be simpler and leaner um, because of the people that are attracted to it. So we've talked about the cost, we've talked about the bureaucracy, and now we're going to talk about empowering the local church. One of the great things I've had the opportunity to work on in the Dakotas UMC is that we shifted our focus about 10 years ago to be more on empowering and equipping the local church. And I think the Global Methodist denomination brings that to the next level. One of the clearest ways that I see how a church is empowered is the trust clause. And if you're not familiar with the trust clause, I do have a video on that and I'll put that in the description, but the trust clause is the denomination has an ownership stake in your property and not just the building. I mean, every dollar that went in the offering plate, every pew Bible, every chair, the denomination owns a little bit of that. And that's why in the United Methodist denomination, which has a trust clause, it's so difficult to leave it. There's this set process and it's kind of expensive. And um, actually, that's expiring at the end of 2023. So then there won't be a way, at least that I know of, uh, for a church to leave the United Methodist denomination versus the Global Methodist denomination has no trust clause. So you don't like the denomination, you just leave. You don't have to do anything. You already own all your property. You already own your checking account and everything else. I remember asking Keith Boyette, who is one of the leaders of the Global Methodist denomination, are you concerned about this? And he said, you know, if we're not serving churches so well that they want to willingly be part of our denomination, why would we force them to be part of our denomination? And I really like that. So, um, and there are other ways that the, the Global Methodist denomination is trying to empower local churches. One of them is there's no guaranteed appointment. So that means pastors don't take priority over the local church. So when there's guaranteed appointment, if you're not an effective pastor, you can be shuffled around from church to church to church 
and you might never um, do well, but you're still guaranteed a position. Uh, there, that doesn't exist in the global Methodist denomination. The appointment process is hopefully going to be more, um, more of a consultation process. Uh, hopefully it's still just as quick and that you're, there's not a gap between when your pastor leaves and when your new pastor comes, but it, it's supposed to be more of a consultation. And it's not a year to year thing too, where you, you have to worry, is my pastor going to leave this year or not? It's, it's, um, the appointments are for an indefinite period of time. And when it becomes clear that you, to the pastor or to the church that there needs to be a change, that's when we start entering in that consultation process. The other thing that I think is important too is there's a push at least to restrict bishops and maybe put in a term limit or something like that to make sure that, um, again, to, to make sure that the churches are protect, protected and empowered. In the global Methodist denomination, one of the things that I'm looking forward to is that we're going to feel like we're all on the same team. More or less, we're going to feel like we're all on the same team. And and I like to use this picture of one of the local sports teams. You know, whenever I go to the church, I pick their local sports team. Because that idea of the how a coach cares for not only the success of each player, but they care for the success of the team as well. And they're balancing that out. And each player, they're caring for each other, but they're also looking to the coach for advice and guidance and direction. Um, I, I could see that if a denomination would run more like that. Uh, we would be better off. But instead, in the United Methodist denomination, it feels like there's different teams and they're competing. And sometimes you may have felt that if you went to annual conference or maybe you have had a district superintendent that you felt like they really weren't on your team. They just wanted you to be good and behave and not cause any problems. Uh, they, they may not have cared about your success or you may not have felt that they cared anyway. Hopefully... In the global methodist denomination you'll feel like we're all on the same team and that's been my experience at some of the gatherings that i've been to um, you don't have to have your guard up you don't have to make sure you're talking politically correct or whatever you can um, you can say your beliefs and you can speak to people and you know that they have the same idea of success that you do I also want you to know that you're not alone. I know there's not a lot of information on the United Methodist Conference website or the, the denominations website a church is going through the process. It's hard to find and it could easily feel like you're alone, but I usually share with Dakota's churches anyway, these are the churches that are in process. The ones that are bold, they've already completed the process and the other ones, they are in process. And I do that because chances are I don't think that Dakotas is unusual in this way, but we just know people. We know the pastors and the people at these different places. And we have connections and we can make phone calls and, and have conversations and, and share this, uh, our struggles and our concerns. And I think that's a cool thing. And I also want to remind them too, that there's a lot of churches that are in the same place. In the Dakotas, I have a spreadsheet and I have roughly 75 other churches that are in the process of deciding if they want to, leave the denomination. So